for your son Jesus and his sacrifice on our behalf. And, uh, please help us always hold him uh, front and center for our lives. We are aware this morning of George Banta um, and possibly difficulties he's having with his health. Uh, please, please be with him. Uh, bless him. Uh, bring his family together so uh, they can give him some peace. But please, Lord, give him peace yourself. Uh, Father, as we're studying this morning uh, in Acts, please uh, bless us with your word. Bless us with the words of your apostles. Uh, help us to bring that together uh, and focus ultimately on Jesus and, and his resurrection. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Yeah. You know, something else we need to keep in prayer. They closed the birth thing at West yeah. Valley. Oh. And some of these people are like, we there, and we're going to come to have their babies here. Mm -hmm. And they closed and Now that. they've got to go, I don't know, where do they go? Boise or something? Probably. Yeah. 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 Now, yeah. The birth Just, yeah. oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I actually Christine told me about that yesterday. I, I forgot about that. Yeah, it was that. <laughs> Chuck Miller got it too. Chuck did? Okay. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> My parents are getting on up there and they fall pretty regularly these days. So falling is kind of front and center for a lot of us. All right, so we are talking about the book of Acts, and part of the reason I chose this subject is because Christine and I did a little walkabout last fall. Uh, we went a lot of places, and we didn't really plan it this way, but we actually ended up going a lot of the places where Paul um, visited. So what I do at the beginning of the class is I jump to chapter 19 or 20 and just kind of do a little walk through of some of the places he went. Um, I did uh, Athens a couple weeks ago. Corinth um, is where um, I gave you last week. And let me turn, I'm sure that it turned this on. So this is um, Turkey, modern day Turkey. Um, this is what was Macedonia to Paul. Um, and so he got the Macedonian call. And so he was over here uh, around Troas and uh, had the dream to up here to Thessalonica, um, Philippi, Berea, and ultimately was run out of those places essentially. Um, he came down here to Athens. He made his speech on the Aragopagus Hill and um, stayed there for a while, then came over here to Corinth, um, found Aquila and Priscilla. Joined up with them, made tents, but also preached um, in Corinth. Stayed there a couple years, as I recall. Um, and finally, he's ready to move on. And so he takes Priscilla and Aquila with him. And he heads across the little Aegean uh, Sea here to Ephesus. It's so, not little. It's what? It's, it's not little. Trip. It's true. I was it, On the map, it looks little. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a good ways. I, I wouldn't want to row it. Um, so over here to Ephesus. And we're actually kind of putting two trips together. In 19, he comes to Ephesus. He doesn't stay long. He, stayed, uh, he brought Aquila and Priscilla with him. He drops them off. And then he makes a trip over here um, to Syria and down to Caesarea. And just in a few verses, he turns back around and heads back, and we end up in Ephesus again. So if, you don't, if you're not careful reading, you, you sort of go from Ephesus, quick trip, uh, back to Ephesus. And the second trip to Ephesus is a new journey, I suppose. Um, and that's where we get the big kind of deal that some of my slides will show today is actually on this return trip. Um, there's the big row, the big riot. Um, at the theater in Ephesus, and I'll show you a couple of pictures, though that's still in existence, they still do concerts. Um, in fact, they've done a lot to Ephesus. So, um, Randy's not here, but I'll do this anyway. Little dropping red dots. Um, so, Ephesus is like Corinth and some of these others. It's not the same place as the modern city. 
Um, in fact, there is no Ephesus that's not the ruins. The modern city is called Kusadasi. And this is where all the cruise ships will post um, and drop people off. And you can see a bit here, this is just another big modern city. So Kusadasi is close to Ephesus. Ephesus is just the ruins. And they are pretty extensive, they're pretty big. Um, and so you dock here, and it's about a 20, 30 minute bus ride from Kusadasi to Ephesus ruins where they've got all the Roman Forum and all of that, I'll show you in a minute. Um, one of the things that traditionally um, after Jesus was crucified, after the church starts and gets going, um, Mary moves to Ephesus. And so to this day, we have what is thought to be um, Mary's house where she retired um, and was taken care of by the apostles um, and folks that were in Ephesus, the church there. Um, little picture here Christine took of one of the monks visiting the place, so still of interest to even the religious folks <coughs> to come and, and spend some time at, at this house. Yeah, David? So did John move to Ephesus? Was you know, I, I think that's how it got. Somehow, and I'd have to go back and look again, but I think before or after he was exiled, he ended up in Ephesus for a while, and, and Mary supposedly... Um, was there as well. So. How this is, far is this land from today's Israel? Um, you know, it's several hundred, well, it's several hundred miles. And so I can go back here. So Israel is over here. Oh. And then what you have to do is go through Syria and then the rough part of Turkey. And so clear over across Turkey. So this is I don't know if it's a thousand miles, but it's several hundred miles. Um. <clears throat> Gib, when you're in these places, I mean, is it pretty obvious that most people are kind of biblical tourists, you know, if you will, or mm -hmm. they're, they're going for that reason, or is it a general tourist destination in Europe? Right? Yeah, it's, it, so, so kind of yes to both of those. The, there is a lot of tourists. In fact, you have to wait and find your window to even take a picture of Mary's house without a thousand people around it. So you get one, and probably half a second later, they're there again. So you kind of time your picture. Um, but it's interesting, if you recall back, we, we had a trip to the monasteries, um, kind of up by Berea, and there was religious folks in their garb visiting, and. Even here, there was, you know, monks and some folks that came. So they were kind of tourists, but obviously they weren't incognito and have their street clothes on. Right that there. guy was a Franciscan, and they're in charge of him. And, and, and that's right. As, you, as you're <coughs> sure, I, I recall, it was the Franciscans that keep that house up. And so I don't know if he was uh, doing his rotation or if he was actually just visiting him. Um, so you walk into the ruins, to Ephesus, it's a, essentially a Roman forum, and so this predates Paul by a number of centuries, uh, but, and I'm, I'm putting this up here, is to just show you that they build on top of whatever came before and use it over and over again. And so this was just kind of along the main street. Um, I don't know what it was, there weren't really signs, but what you do know after you've been to a few of these places is you can see the old stuff. The old stuff was good craftsmanships. They had, I guess they had slaves or something that could spend the time. But you look here and you see these Roman arches and these big blocks. Okay, that's the old stuff. That's what they put in originally. A lot of craftsmanship. It's not easy to get these arches wedged in. So a lot of effort, a lot of time put into figuring out the angles and getting those put in. So along here is this series of Roman arches and that's the old stuff. And anytime you start seeing little stuff stuck in, they've built over it. And so you can kind of look up above here, and these are smaller blocks. Um, and that could have been, who knows? I mean, I'm sure the guys that dug this up know when it was, but I don't. Um, it looks like the aqueduct. You know, it kind of does. Um, I didn't really see an aqueduct formal, and it could have been. Um, and in fact, it, 
There's one like that on uh, yeah. Caesarea. Yeah, there are several around. So what Keith is talking about, he said it looked like an aqueduct. And they often did that as they went to the hills and built essentially a canal elevated. And so they often did these um, arches and then built a trough on the top of it to get water into the city. And that, it could have been at one time that. Um, but you also look down here and these more reddish bricks, you see a lot of those. That was kind of the latest guys that came in and did other things to it. So nothing really special about this picture. It's just you can see that over and over again, this site was reused by different people for different things and a lot of overlays. Um, here is the main street. Um, this would have been where Paul had walked uh, when he was there. And you notice, first thing is that there is just one huge mosaic that's laid down there. And they've reconstructed it, put it together. And so fine tiles, um, nice designs all the way up this long, you know, 100 yards or more uh, street <coughs> with all sorts of businesses and columns on the side. Um, lots of different things, different places. And you can stop and spend a lot of time reading about kind of the different things along the way. Um, kind of a, adding on to what Keith said about the aqueduct, don't know if that's what supplied the water, but what I do know is that there were a lot of pipes running around. So even in those days, they had the ceramic uh, pipes. Some places had lead pipes. Um, in Rome and Pompeii, you see lead pipes still that were used, which probably isn't a great idea. Um, but there were a lot of pipes running around that had been originally there to to pipe water to houses and buildings. Um, and so there was some waterworks and some infrastructure going on um, fairly extensively and lots of, off this main street, just lots of ruins and houses and buildings that were used over the years. <coughs> um, what we're gonna talk about down the line is sort of the, the, the Sanhedrin, the local rulers and, and officials. And this was not the big um, theater where we're gonna see Paul had the big issues with people. Um, just along the side of the road, um, the roads running out here, this was sort of what they call an Odeon, just sort of a little public gathering place. So this would have been where the local government officials met and they had a little um, Around surround us, surrounding seating to go ahead and take care of those meetings and all. So, kind of an interesting little um, side there. Yep. Um, so, I don't want to, I don't want to offend anybody, but one of the more interesting things you see in some of these places is the restrooms. <laughs> and so, on the left hand side is I assume this was a men's restroom. I'm not positive. Um, <laughs> But my guess is, and there was more to it, I didn't include some other pictures, but um, along the edges, you can have a seat with your friends and chat business while you're taking care of business, I guess. Um, they did have water running through there, and so there was a trough running underneath that would carry the waste um, on out. So, and it, it was more than just that, on the, in the center there was a fountain, um, a fairly large fountain, some other kind of spa looking things in there, so lots of stuff going on. Um, and this was kind of in the, the center part of town. Um, a lot of the ruins do have facilities uh, like that. Um, in fact, archeologists like to dig through those because they find all sorts of things down in there um, that was left behind. Just one place that would just sort of struck me as odd was in Pompeii. Um, you go to Pompeii, they excavated some of the um, outhouses and they found a giraffe leg okay I, I'm sure it got thrown there it didn't eat, get eaten but somehow a giraffe leg and I just thought what's up with that um, on this side is probably one of the more interesting things that we walked through um, Christine booked us with a, we had a guide just to ourselves um, and he had access to this um, but this was where the fancy people lived and if you would have walked here just not that many decades ago, it would have just been a hillside. Um, but they said, oh, there's something down here, and they started clearing it out. Um, and this is the housing for kind of the people that live on the hill over the town. Okay, so probably 
Roman officials or priests or something. And uh, I mean, it was, you could tell it had been covered with dirt and scraped off, but it was fancy digs. Yeah, Chad? Well, so they've been digging on this for at least a decade. Um, and so, but there was another hillside over the way they hadn't even started on. And so it's very slow, very methodical. Um, they do a lot of, back in the day, they didn't much. They just kind of uncovered it and went on. Um, anymore, they catalog and record and do lots of, of uh, keeping track of what's there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, well, yeah unless they absolutely come something obvious that they can use a you know a, a cat or something but um, yeah and I, I'll show you a picture in just a minute of trying to put them back together but you but but still some of the floors um, here's a, a mosaic floor and anytime you see a lion you got to think it's Rome and so something patriotic here if you look close enough there is always something the lion is holding down and has captured and so Rome is always showing up in all sorts of places. And here's one, there were, I don't think I pictured it, but a couple of these other floors had some of the, the gods. So Medusa is one that's pretty, pretty uh, popular. So you have the lady, pleasant enough face, but she's got snakes coming out of her head. So pretty, pretty wild hair, um, but very nice plaster and very intricate painting on the walls. And if you look back through here, these are all plastered over, got um, designs and birds, and there's some people um, around. So, so pretty fancy digs. Yeah, <laughs> all sorts of connections. Here's just some designs. You see a lot of those uh, columns. Um, and they had running water. And so they have a lot of piping that goes back and forth through these things. I didn't really notice any restroom facilities, but at least they had piping. Okay, so maybe some indoor plumbing and uh, and all that. Keith. Mm -hmm. Right. To use, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, they. Keith is talking about cement um, and the Romans and even uh, Herod the Great uh, over in Israel had figured out how to use cement. And so they, I think they went to Italy or somewhere to get it, um, some of the volcanic stuff, but piped it over and had pretty fantastic blocks of cement and things they did with it. So. Um, yeah, okay, so there's some piping, um, indoor plumbing. This is um, some of the workstations Christine was talking about. Um, they, there's a lot of marble around, and what they did is they could get a block of marble and they perfected how to use silk thread and olive oil. And they could run a kind of a saw um, with the silk thread and they just sliced off thin layers of the marble and you can see them trying to put it back together. Obviously, over the years, it's crumbled up, uh, but they've actually started to put some of the marble back up on the sides. You can see some assembly down here. And so they're going through, I can't imagine doing this for a living, but reassembling rubble back into the approximation of the marble. And you can imagine this was a, a huge gathering room in this house, um, very elaborate. I mean, it would have been marble floor to ceiling and all over um, at one time. So a lot of, a lot of fancy stuff going on here. Um, and this is just some of the sheeting they put together that was continuous enough to go ahead and put up in a piece. All right, so uh, as far as Paul being involved in Ephesus, he was um, there, he addressed the Jews. Um, Aquila and Priscilla were there. And in fact, when he takes off, after just a short time after getting to Ephesus, Aquila and Priscilla stay there. 
and that's where they meet up with Apollos. And Apollos was well-schooled in the scripture, but they taught him the more perfect way. Okay, and so he became a missionary as well. That happened. Um, when Paul gets back, um, he is so successful in his preaching that he really makes the folks there angry, especially the ones who are depending on their living coming from making Artemis statues. So this was the big front and center for Artemis. Um, she was the goddess that was the big temple that was there, and they would make these silver statues, sell them to the tourists, and so as soon as Paul came in and started talking about, and, and we see the, the church um, referred to as the way um, in those days, comes in, they start throwing away all of their sorcery, they burn their books. In fact, the account says they burned 50,000 drachmas worth of magic books. Um, and people were getting um, really agitated because they depended on selling these magic things and the statues. And when that started to go away, there was the fellow named Demetrius that was losing money. And so he started stirring up the crowd. Paul never actually gets involved in it um, as he wanted to go in and face off. But um, so Demetrius starts agitating and all of the people end up in this theater. And this is the big theater. And it really is pretty huge. Um, still standing. They still have concerts and things there. It's lit for night entertainment um, but apparently this guy was filled up and they chanted for hours great is Diana um, of the Ephesians and so trying to get the um, the idea that Artemis is where we need to be focused um, and it ends up finally um, the city what was it, clerk or something, comes in and calms him down a little bit and says, well, you take him to court if you're mad at him. Um, the, the, let the judges figure it out. And so they went away. So that was kind of the, the big riot. A lot of uh, intense things going on, but Paul was not there actually to face off with them. But kind of an interesting uh, thing, there was a lot of people that would run around. There was people in the little stage there that just liked to um, talk. And you could hear... You could hear good acoustics. Um, they also liked to dance, and so there was a bunch of dancers out there. You know, I'm, I'm thinking it was in the low tens of thousands, like 30, 30K, something like that. So a lot, a lot. Yeah, they still, they've repaired them enough that they're, you know, it's not great, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Keith? Pretty obvious, yeah. Mm -hmm. That issue, yeah. It was an interesting time, wasn't it? So, um, you know, some places in, in the New Testament talks about Jesus came when the time was right. Well, they were focused on Old Testament scriptures. And so all of the sermons we see front and center are the prophets. Um, and not only that, there were people who weren't all that happy with the, the governing temple people in Jerusalem, followers of John the Baptist that had gone out. So there was all sorts of interesting things going on as a context for, for what the apostles did. So um, This is probably the most famous thing in uh, the forum. It would have been after Paul, though. It's called the Cicero, Cicero's Library, and it was a, a big library. Um, they've reconstructed it. This wasn't standing, but they found all the pieces, put it back together. Um, and so this is Cicero's Library. And you can see the tourists come in, and this is a favorite place to do selfies, and they have even some fancy cameras set up, and 
they were fancily dressed and modeling and doing all sorts of things. But um, quite an interesting facade. Um, the library itself wasn't that big, but apparently in the day it had you know lots and lots of scrolls and, and things. Um, one of the interesting things as well is they light this up at night. Not just this, but the whole street, the whole area is lit up. Um, and they do a lot of entertaining. In fact, uh, I don't know this next one. This is a night um, vision. This is the, the uh, lighting that they did. And the cruise line we were on to get here set us up in these tables and they had a little three-piece orchestra and they served us food and stuff. Um, so a lot of touristy things going on, lots of things you can walk around and see even at night. The theater's are lit, the streets are lit, um, pretty, pretty intense um, development of a nightlife in this ruin. Um, just to show we were there, this is not a selfie incidentally, our guide took it so I can include it. Um, there is the library in the background and this is the main street, you can see tourists. Um, in the summer it gets even more touristy. You hardly can move around. Um, but one of the interesting things here on the side is one of the, the sides, uh, little buildings that they developed had um, the Amazons. These are Amazon women. And so um, it's interesting that Timothy was written from Ephesus um, and some of his statements about uh, to women you'll be saved in childbirth, that sorts of thing, um, Artemis was not in favor of childbirth. Um, in fact, she was the goddess of the hunt. She was not a fertility goddess, but she was the god of the Amazons, which were warriors, celibate. Um, they even went so far as to, I think, cut off one of their breasts so they could have more efficient shooting bows and arrows or something. Probably tall warriors uh, and all that. So. Um, a lot of research is going on right now um, about the book of Timothy that we've got some statements in there we're just puzzled about um, trying to make sense and it probably has to do with we're understanding Artemis and kind of the culture in Ephesus a little better now um, I think oh I had to do this one just because so the punchline for all of the guides is this you probably can't read this this is Latin but you get down here and you look closely enough. I love Elvis. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the punchline they always use. So throw that in there. All right. I am still baffled by this thing, but we'll go with it. Um, I'm trying to get the, the words to fit on, and I give lots of edge around the slide. It just doesn't seem to. This is probably... I don't know, one of my favorite little descriptions of church life. It's right after the Pentecost. They've come together and people have joined um, into a church group. And this is Luke's attempt to go ahead and describe this perfect church. Okay, it doesn't last long, um, but initially this is what they were shooting for. And so let me just go ahead uh, you guys may have to finish this for me. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Is that the end? Okay. So the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved or something like that. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so just kind of notice a little bit about what this group did. Um, in fact, our church, when, when, or the elders, when we, we kind of put together the program here, used this first verse as sort of what we see as the ideal thing for us to be involved in. Four things the people were, were close to. Um, the apostles' teaching, and so one of our big things here is teaching, study, scripture. 
Um, that was front and center for them. And if you go through these sermons and any time any of the people talked about what was going on with the gospel, scripture was front and center. Okay, they pulled up scripture um, a lot. So we had the apostles teaching. Fellowship was another big deal. Um, and fellowship was seen even further on. Not just fellowship, we got together for a potluck, um, but they had sort of a, a community of goods. And so it was no longer yours and mine, it was ours, um, which goes on to the next story a little bit more fully. Um, but fellowship, the breaking of bread, and I, I don't, you know, you can argue this, some scholars do, whether this is Lord's Supper, but I don't think it was specifically. I think it was just they shared meals together. Um, so breaking of bread is an odd term that shows up sometimes, but um, had meals together um, and to prayer. Okay, and those things are front and center in what held this community together. And we'll see that has glitches that comes up in the next few uh, chapters. Um, let's see. Everything in common um, is uh, sort of a a word that shows up outside of the New Testament in some of the Greek um, Stoic and, and all those philosophers that are out there having things in common meant not just stuff but also you were sharing in each other's lives okay so you were good friends and so the idea that these church folks weren't just showing up kind of doing their thing and walking away they actually interacted and so all things in common could mean this you know, goods and services kind of thing, but it also had to do with they were personal. Um, and so that's kind of a broader term. Um, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. This will show up as some of the issues that come up because that is a nice thought. In fact, I remember growing up, I thought, well, that's kind of what the socialist communist idea is. Maybe that's what's right. Um, the problem is, as you get to these next chapters, and not everybody buys into the um, what's mine is mine and what's yours is mine is more what they want. Um, and to go the other way is a bit more of a problem. So ideally, we take care of each other, um, but issues show up not far down the line. Um, okay, and kind of the end of this is he adds to the church. The church keeps growing. They see a community like this and it attracts people, the message, the teaching, but also the sharing of lives. Um, that's more of a modern thing. Yeah, more of a modern thing. I'm gonna have to see if this screen is short because I've done all I can do to get stuff to fit on here and I even have big margins, so I'm not sure why. Okay, but let me just kind of run through this. Um, it turns out if, if you look back as sort of a literary critic, um, and look at these chapters coming up, there's a definite pattern to what Luke does in all of the next accounts. And we'll go through a couple of them today, hopefully. Um, and the idea that as we see these first events, there are four things that show up um, repeatedly as a pattern for how Luke tells the story. And so um, in this first one we'll go through is 3-1 to 4-4, four, four, so a chapter um, healing the lame man. Um, but this is also the pattern that we saw at Pentecost when Peter, Peter did his sermon. So this pattern shows up over and over again. And we'll talk about kind of why, um, what's Luke trying to get across. But the idea is that um, the account will always start out with essentially God doing something through his spirit. Okay, Something miraculous will show up. And so for Pentecost, for example... You saw the spirit come down and everybody heard in their own language, okay? Um, in this section coming up, God comes and uses the apostles to heal a lame man. So there's some action um, that God does and that's always front and center for these eight chapters, 10 chapters coming up. Um, and then there is a little bit of people saying, what on earth is going on? Okay, they saw everybody heard in their own language. We saw a couple of weeks ago. They're going, what's up with this? And the, the scholars kind of 
think, I mean, it's not an ignorance, judgmental sort of thing, but it's just the people don't understand how God acts. And so there's some sort of introduction of people and they're just saying, what's going on with this? Then there is some kind of gospel message that's proclaimed. And so each of these will have some sermon, some shorter, um, some longer, just depending. And then um, at the end, which is cut off here, the story goes back um, to the crowd. Okay, so after the sermon, you go back and you kind of are a news reporter and you interview people and different people give their response. And some of it is negative, some of it's very sarcastic, some of it is we've joined um, with this movement. So all sorts of reasons. So these four parts are sort of what um, show up um, in all of these stories. Is it? Okay. Um, so here is the, the first story, at least the first part of the first story. And so I've, I've labeled this God's action. And so Acts 3, 1, um, if you can't read this, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Um, now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple, uh, the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the court, temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them um, for money. And Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped uh, to his feet and began to walk. And then went with them. And that is verse 8. The man, let's see, this is not even Acts. That's not going to do us any good. Um, so went with him to the temple, was walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Um, and so there is God acting sort of in this first pain of this story, and um, we see this man walking. Okay, de some details that are kind of interesting as you um, wade through here. Um, Peter and John didn't have money. Where did all their money go? Seems to think, or at least the thought is, that this common holding of, of property was that big a part of their lives then. So they really didn't think they had their own, um, but they held it all in common. And so perhaps they had bought whatever they had to for the group and just didn't have the money to go ahead and carry on. So this idea of things in common might have been bigger than we even realize. We didn't just keep some back for us, but they didn't have money. What they did have, they passed on. And so um, a beggar um, is one who is put outside the gates. In fact, they couldn't go in. Um, so the beggar was not an insider, but he was an outsider. Okay, outsiders um, weren't allowed to go in and pray, um, and so he sat outside and hit up the good folks that came in the gates for um, coins. That is really a front and center thing for this per first part of Acts. Um, if you think about it, what we're getting to through this whole first part is that outsiders become insiders. Okay, and this is our first our first example, he was Jewish apparently, but he was an outside Jew. And so he sat at the gate, he couldn't go in because of his infirmity um, and pray. And so he sits out and asks for money. And what we see in this is an outsider becomes an insider. Okay, and what's going to be the next step is eventually we get to Gentiles who are outsiders 
become insiders. So all of these we start seeing outsiders become insiders, and that's the message that the first part of Acts is trying to get across. Ultimately, is that just like the prophecy Joel gave us a couple chapters ago, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, and so we start seeing how that happens. Um, notice, just a speculation, um, but why is there so much intent on eye contact in this? Take a look at this. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Okay? Why would there be so much focus on looking back and forth at each other? What's, what's the message there? Okay, contact? Mm-hmm. 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 Right. I, I think that's front and center there. Is all of a sudden, this is not just going to the temple and praying or whatever. This is going with people, and there's fellowship, there's commonality. And so suddenly this beggar who is about to become an insider, part of that inside process is the contact between you. And that's, I think, front and center in what churches should be about. Um, so this contact, um, and then he goes ahead and um, heals him in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, taking him by the hand, helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong, and um, he began to walk. In fact, he starts to leap. And so this is kind of conversion 101. People can't walk. People begin to walk, and then as they learn more, become more of an insider, uh, then they leap and they run. Um, and so there's kind of that whole growth um, process going on. And where do they take him first? Is with the insiders into the temple for prayer. Okay, these, these first church folks didn't pause and, and uh, uh, do things outside. They were publicly going into the prayer. They still participated in the Jewish rites. Um, times and so they went in and took the the lame man um, inside okay it's on I hit the button it's not going ah. um people's response. So here's the second part. Um, down here at the bottom is a, a mock-up of Jerusalem in the first century. This is at the Israel Museum. Uh, pretty fantastic. It covers the best part of an acre or so. By the time you get it, here's the temple. And here was the Temple Mount. Here is what they think is. Nobody really knows, but they think one of the inner gates was a beautiful gate. So people went in here uh, for prayer. Um, he was sitting outside and um, they took him inside for prayer. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were all filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man uh, held onto Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. And so, over to the side of the temple is kind of this building that had a lot of columns. That's where people came. Um, but just kind of notice what happened. Um, they took him inside. So we just talked quite a bit about him becoming an insider. Um, the man held on to, um, that's an interesting Greek word. It wasn't like he just went on in with them, but he was attached. Okay, this is clinging. And so he clung to them. They took him inside for prayer. Um, and um, kind of the second part of all of these stories is the people say, what's up? What's going on? We don't understand. And so I've titled this one, Ignorance. And so the people are trying to figure out what's up. They ask, um, and then that sets up kind of the last, the, the next part is we're gonna get a speech. Okay, so people are saying, what, what did we just see? Explain that, and so we, we do that. Chad, did we already have two bells? We already had two bells. Okay, so 
Remember this, we will start with this guy next week um, and pick up and finish this and do a couple more of the stories. The pattern gets to be very regular, so we can probably cover several of these, but um, there's still some interesting things to pick out about the relationship that, that gets built between the apostles and the church um, and people who are outsiders. Thank you guys. Have some coffee. We'll see you next week.